There's so much that I can say tonight, so I hope that I don't go into a rabbit hole. I'm a deep thinker, and I like to talk about meaning, purpose, and articulate that in some form of philosophical way. This is my first time sharing. I did share my testimony a while ago, but it was in a group format, which was so cool. When it comes to my topic and you expect a dramatic conclusion, expect not. My goal tonight is to be the flint to your stone from within. It's up to you to cause a spark inside yourself, to be an ever-consuming fire going forward, of course, with the help of God. My topic for tonight is, at the heart of an issue I've been dealing with for some time, probably more than I can remember, and that is one of depression. Although my testimony has many mazes and stories of what I call battle scars, depression is something I've held on to and claimed as my own. This great big emptiness has caused this young man to stumble into loneliness, hurt, pain, and brokenness, which became the name of the game. For the last three months, I've had three moods, empty, alone, and confused, being scorched from the phrase I call burnt out, especially from life, mental fatigue. We all know what that's like. I spiraled into deep depression, not knowing, seeing, or even believing. Steps became harder to follow, and laughter became like fingerprints on an abandoned rail, very vague, but ever disappearing. My lips say, fine, I'm good, thanks. But my heart and my eyes tell a different story. They sing a different tune. And my soul, my soul just weeps. You're probably thinking, what led to all of this, Blake? It was a roller coaster of failures and a very unrealistic expectation of how to live a life. Of what I call, and quote from Brian Tracy, is the someday island. An island where you put all your dreams all your desires that you want to achieve, but they're so unrealistic and unattainable that they succumb to a fantasy world. But for me, it's a constant, endless list of goals, targets that I can never live up to, a deep dissatisfaction of myself, a damaged view of what the world should look like and what people look like, a numbness of emotion covering the raw root of pain. So when depression walked in, or should I say when I opened the door, it came and fought against every desire and dreams and left a big hole. When you suffer from depression, I'm tired means a permanent state of exhaustion that sleep doesn't fix. Sleep just isn't sleep anymore. In fact, it's an escape. A human being can survive almost anything as long as he or she sees the end in sight, but depression is so insidious and it compounds daily, making it impossible to see the end. That fog is like a cage without a key. You can never pinpoint what it is, nor process it. What depression is like, it's like drowning when you know how to swim, even when the lifeguard is next to you. When you depress, you don't control your thoughts, your thoughts control you. What I've recently learned about depression is that there are four types, funny enough. Biological being the first, meaning that those that are born with a chemical imbalance a lack of nutrition, sunlight, and many more things. Their state of sadness is based on lack of due to inability. The second one comes from relational depression that results from sort of family issues, divorce, heartache, betrayal. The third is circumstantial, a loss of grief, trauma, or perhaps even financial issues. Then there's the last one, and that's the spiritual one a deep emptiness from life and a lack of purpose and relationship with the Father. For so long, I could not understand how this one word became so powerful that it dictated so much in my life. It felt like I was storing everything in a piggy bank. And God came recently, picked it up, looked at it, and crushed it. And it hurt. A lot of things in my life were exposed, lies I believed of myself, and what my future would look like. The truth is this. I was never designed for this. I was never made to be confined within the walls of my mind. And I figured out that there are actually two truths when it comes to depression. With the help of Craig Rochelle's sermons I've been watching, and this is what I found. The first truth being your emotions are valid. And the second, your situation feels hopeless. These are the two truth statements, but they are incomplete. Instead, it should sound like this. 
Your emotions are valid, but they're not permanent. Your situation feels hopeless, but with God, there's always hope. Add this all together, and you probably see that I'm in the process of refinement. To those that don't know what refinement is, it's a season where God takes you to work on areas in your life, very tough seasons, but fruitful ones. However, I'm beginning to love the process, regardless of the numerous failures. Recently, God broke me in a weird but necessary way, and I'm starting to realize the purpose in that. Anyone who battles with depression, sadness, even brokenness, will feel and think that their words aren't enough. But that's not the case. In fact, the enemy doesn't want your words to be heard. During this season, your voice matters the most. And this refinement is like going into an oven. The faster you leave is like being placed in the oven for five minutes and getting taken out to only realize that you're undercooked. However, staying too long and going too slow in life is like being in an oven for three hours to only realize that you got really badly burnt. There's no flavor to your life. But the one that goes in God's timing in this journey and his plan is like getting taken out to realize that you're full of flavor and the meat falls off the bone. So remember when you fall or fail, and I use my favorite quote here, it's better to try and fail than fail to try. So get up, go at it again. The process is worth loving. I'm led to my first scripture of tonight, which is in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. And it says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. There are two types of comfort you can get and rely on. The first being worldly comfort, although it feels nice, and it's an instant gratification. It never lasts. In fact, it adds on to your depression, your sadness, and your brokenness. Or you can be wise and go to God who gives you fullness and wholeness. It may not be what you expect, but it's far greater than all the pleasures of the world. So I'm putting my neck on the line, and I've got two words that I'm going to be speaking of and sharing, of what God's been speaking to me about depression and sadness and holding on and not letting go. So the first story, funny enough, is about watching South African Survivor Series, The Return of the Outcast. <laughs> my struggle with any with everything in my life, had become like a game of Survivor. And anyone who watches Survivor knows how chaotic it is. With starvation, hunger pains, deceitfulness, blindsiding, stealing, fighting, etc., the list goes on. And what God was saying to me during this, that he has given me this immunity idol. So when the enemy thinks he's got me in the ring and is about to vote me off this game of life, God comes and places that immunity on me. It causes so much confusion in the enemy's camp, not because of anything I did that was special, but because of him who was nailed to the cross. Which leads me to Romans 8, 37 to 39, NIV version. Powerful verse. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither heart nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's the beauty of a relationship with God. He stays. He stays through the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, through the mountains and the valleys, through the wilderness and fires, through the seasons of obedience and phases of rebellion, through the moments of doubt anger, addiction, sorrow, confusion, and bitterness. Through the pain, sickness, heartache, and despair, he knows the deepest, darkest part of your humanity. And he assumes you will have your moments when they will get the best of you. He knows you will fall into temptation and stumble in sin. He knows you will choose to rebel like a prodigal child. He anticipates it. Yet he never once considers the possibility of leaving you. Because if he loved you while you were the enemy, he'll never stop loving you while you're a runaway friend. 
this is relationship and God is in it for eternity. The second word that God spoke to me about is at a parking lot. I saw myself at this parking lot very similar to the one in Pavilion. I'm very sure it was the same one. (laughs) I was paying the fee at this parking machine so I can leave. And every time I slipped in the coins, they would come back to the bottom. And I'll pay again and again. Frustration started kicking in as I wasn't accepting the payment. So I could not leave the area and drive off to my next destination until the payment has been fulfilled. The Lord entered this picture, saying, step aside and watch. He went to this machine, placed his hand on it, saying, I've paid in full price. It's time for you to go. You are free to leave. Time is at the essence. For many, it's difficult to let go. But you can spend a lot of time wasting and staring at something that Jesus said let go of or leave it behind. We tend to be focused on the pain and brokenness so much that we forget that we are free to overcome and leave the area. In this case, depression. What the Lord showed me afterwards was how dirty my car had become. From standing and staring at this machine for so long, it was covered in dust and needed a lot of cleaning, being neglected there all this time. I was even scared that I was not going to start, maybe thinking the battery died. What most people do not know, spiritually speaking, is that a car represents some sort of purpose. Well, in my case, a purpose I was forgotten in all this depression. And the more you neglect that calling, that ambition, the more it seems to get out of reach. Then you go back to this binge loop, trying to find places, people, objects to fill that void. Not only do I need to walk out the area, but I need to clean my purpose in order to leave depression behind. And all it takes is a shift of a perspective from mine to God's. Our Roy, meaning God, God who sees me, he knows the way out, but most importantly, the way forward. I'm taken to Psalms 37 to 23 to 24. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Mm. So, to sum everything up, what I'm trying to say tonight is to let go, love the process, be present in the moment. There's a purpose in your suffering, there's a purpose in your struggles. Thank you. Should I pray for you? So I'm just going to pray for everyone, a prayer for hope. So everyone, close your eyes. Father God, we lift our hands up towards you, Father. We lift your name up. We pray for hope to rise in this room. We pray for lights to be switched on in our heads, in our hearts, and around us, Father. We pray that you break depression. We pray, Father, that you break the numbness. We pray, Father, that you break the emptiness. And we pray, Jesus, that you fill that. We pray, Jesus, that you take your place in our hearts, in our minds, Father. And we pray, Father, Lord, that you break all this heavy burden off. We pray over this church, Father, that this is a safe place for everyone, a safe place where chains can be broken. And we just thank you, Jesus. Amen.